Good morning, everyone. I'm Sue Boffman from the Association of Research Libraries, and I'm really pleased to welcome all of you to our second workshop of our workshop series um, conducted by our colleagues and team partners from the University of Florida. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, this morning. If you were able to attend the first workshop last week, um, we learned about the project um, and I know uh, we recorded the session. So if you did miss that session and are here today for the first time, uh, we'll be sure to share that recording with you. Uh, but we're looking forward to today's workshop to learn more about the project on library spaces uh, and all of the great work that the project team has, has undertaken. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, just a, another quick plug for our initiative, the Research Library Impact Framework. Um, it's been a long project uh, and the UF team has been with us from the very beginning and very appreciative of that. And we're also appreciative that we have an IMLS grant and funds from that grant is supporting our workshop series uh, that you're participating in. So without further ado, let me turn the podium over to you, Jason. Thank you. Well, well thank you. Um, well, first, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's also been an immense pleasure to, to work with, um, with the staff and, and colleagues in UF's library system um, and my other colleague, um, Meg Portillo, uh, we were approached by the library staff um, as a school of interior design. Uh, my name is Jason Manili, by the way. Um, I, I'm a instructor in the Department of Interior Design, an associate professor. Um, and we, we were working with the library for, um, what has it been now, guys? Uh, are we going on? Two and a half years. Two and a half years, yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and a lot of this was pre-COVID too, so it was sort of an interesting, yeah. uh, interesting transition that I know we all faced. Um, but you know, the, the question of space came up, um, came up. The question of creativity um, from the library staff: How do we support it? How do we do it in fundamental ways? And so it's it's been a great pleasure working with a lot of the librarian minds over there. So why don't we introduce the the rest of us here, Laura? Hi. Years and um, I'm the director of assessment and user experience for the libraries, and I'm representing the libraries team, which also includes uh, Valerie Menson, who is our assistant dean of assessment and student engagement, um, and Sarah Gonzalez and uh, Jean Bossart, who are also librarians at the Marston Science Library. And then Thank Meg Portillo. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, I too would echo um, this project really had legs and we uh, are very excited to share some of the work that we did with you. I am Meg Portillo. I'm a professor and associate dean for research and strategic initiatives. And I was very pleased to be um, brought you know, into this uh, project we have a number of in, um, in, we do a, a number of um, evidence-based research and design projects across campus at the University of Florida is our living laboratory but this library project the Marsden library project really allowed us to dive deeply um, particularly um, given the expertise of the faculty um, over in Marsden and in library uh, University of Florida Library Science System. I'm also going to recognize in the audience, uh, Adrian Del Monte, who is, um, ran, ran the course of this project with us as a PhD uh, uh, research assistant. So glad to see Adrian uh, in the audience coming from another time zone in uh, the Philippines. So back to you, Jason. Okay, well, without further ado, um, we're going to start off with a little interactive activity led by led by Laura. So I will go ahead and move that. Laura, I think you might be muted there. Um, okay, if you would please go to www.menti.com and input the code. Um, we are going to have you base your decisions on the two images in front of you on the PowerPoint slide. 
So we're going to ask you to rate the adjectives that we used last week um, based on the images that you're seeing here today. And this mimics what we did with the survey when we deployed it because we were remote. And so we included images of um, the spaces we wanted them to think about as part of that online survey because we knew a lot of people wouldn't be in the libraries at that time. So I'm gonna go ahead and have the first question. And then we'll go to the next question. Go ahead and do that. And then we're going to return and Jason's going to go through. Um, can you see the next question? Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so while we're waiting for that um, to, to populate, uh, just to give you an overview of, of what we're gonna talk about today, sort of our agenda. Um, so we've already done introductions and our interactive activity. Uh, Laura's gonna do a brief review of the library study and sort of the whole purpose behind this project, um, you know, why we were collaborating with, um, you know, why they were collaborating with the Interior Design School. Um, but also give a brief summary of just the research findings that ended up informing some of the design solutions that you're going to see in this presentation. Um, one thing we sort of need to start off on is sort of understanding a little bit about the role of interior design schools. We can sometimes be a misunderstood profession, so we're going to talk a little bit about sort of our role on campus, what we demand of our students, and then um, really start to dive into some of the highlights from these research-informed uh, student design solutions. And then finally, we're going to sort of wrap up with just sort of a little bit of a roundtable discussion um, about sort of the benefits we saw between this library design school collaboration and, um, and, and sort of end with that, but also give you guys an opportunity not just to ask us questions about the project, but hopefully to ask some questions, maybe about your own spaces. You, you do have a couple folks here with design background on online. So, you know, it might be a good time just to sort of give some insight to that. Jason, I need two more minutes. Okay, well, what I'll do is maybe I'll start going on the, okay. <laughs> or Meg, would you like to, why don't you go ahead sure. and uh, go over what, what we did? And I think you'll be the best to talk about this. Sure, absolutely. So again, um, the, the lens we were really looking through was um, how the library can really um, facilitate creativity in uh, the student populations um, in terms of facilitating creative thinking, um, innovative research and problem solving. We were interested in student populations ranging from those who had um, just, just started the university, first year uh, students, all the way through um, graduate and PhD students. And we, uh, we invested, we framed our questions and operationalized um, the methodology using three um, kinds of um, research you know, instruments we were looking at how this space was used, you know, what were the hot spots within this space, you know, where was unutilized space. We were looking from floor to floor. And traditionally, uh, the upper, the higher you went on floors four and five, um, the atmosphere gets quieter and quieter. And our assumptions generally, they're it goes from were graduate student populated to um, undergraduates for, to graduate students. And so um, Adrian Del Monte, who I just introduced you to, um, headed up the observations um, that he 
he did um, analysis on each floor um, that took place over uh, several weeks and really looked at, you know, how, how the space was being utilized both in um, shared communal areas as well as those more private carols or um, more enclosed spaces. We know creativity does um, can be manifest in the individual, but also in groups. And we wanted to see what, what the occupancy and capacity was in terms of getting the spatial baseline analysis. Then we also, um, the, second, the second leg of our um, research focused um, on an online survey that got students um, to really talk about how they were using these library uh, spaces Again, the sample um, that we were able to engage is primarily undergraduate, but we do have a we we do have we did capture um, the graduate student perspectives on how they're using the space, how often they're using the space, and also getting them to think beyond the current existing conditions to ideally what this space would be like. Um, for maximizing their, their um, work individually and in groups, particularly um, related to more creative thinking, whether that was on class assignments they were doing or whether it was really um, analyzing you know, their doctoral dissertation findings. So certain um, findings that that emerged from this survey, we wanted to dig in deeper and find out why and, and how these things were happening. So we set up focus groups that not only included the undergraduate and graduate, but really included some of the library faculty and staff who also use Marsden as a workplace to get their observations. So we did um, the focus groups and again, got them to really talk about the space as it existed, as well as ideally what that space could look like. So the spatial analysis, the online survey and the focus groups, we started to see how the findings um, were triangulated and some findings we expected and others were surprising to us. Jason? I think, yeah, I think one thing that, that I would like to highlight in this you know, three-part uh, approach was that you know, as designers, we've learned that that observations are sometimes your best metric because people may be very biased in what they think they need and they may not know things that they might not be conceptualizing of things that could really benefit their daily life. So so with the spatial analysis, it was definitely based on on site observations. Um, and I think that's a really important uh, sidebar just to put on on this structure. Um, Jason, I sent you that slide and I can cover this while you um, get that out. Okay. okay. Um, hopefully. So, um, Adrian, as we mentioned, um, conducted the observational findings and we talked about that a little bit at the last um, session. And just to recap, you know, we focused on certain times. Um, we identified the busiest and the slowest times. Um, both for the weekdays and the weekends. And so we, uh, Adrian took these layouts of the seating um, for each floor and they did observations to really kind of get an idea of what students were using and how they're using it. Um, and, you know, based on the typology of individual group um, and public private spaces. And so one thing that we also did a little bit further is I kind of analyzed, you know, the capacity utilization of each and also based on the types of seating available. So for instance, on floors one, two, and three, for instance, on floor one, which is the basement, the group seating capacity is 594 out of about uh, 736 seats. And so um, looking at what the capacity was for 
that floor, um, the capacity for group ranged from 1% on Saturday at seven o'clock to 50% on Wednesday between 6.15 and 6.30 p.m. And then for individual use, the range was um, anywhere from, in the basement, it was 21%, and sometimes it went as high as 178%. So what that told us for group, uh, for individual space, um, you know, they, there was an over usage of individual of group space by individuals, individuals right. working in group spaces. And so it's something that we see all the time in libraries, one person sitting at a four top and they have themselves spread out. And so this just kind of um, reinforced for us what we kind of had seen in this and in other studies um, done at Marston even. So uh, by one of our team members, Sheila Bosch. So um, did you wanna add anything about the spatial analysis? Um, no, not at that point. I think this is okay. good. I, I'm only operating on a one screen computer. So I'm, to open up that email, I'm going to have to just dive oh. out here for a second, guys. So let me. Oh, OK, sure. Let sure, me go sure. and get that finding. Hopefully I don't have any spicy emails on screen. Let's see. It's pretty interesting, too. The findings. Wow, it is. Up. Yeah. So let, let yeah. me just throw this back into the PowerPoint real quick. And one thing just to add is when any student comes into the library, they do have access to sit anywhere on these floors. And so they're making determinations, um, what kind of privacy they want, how much eye contact they want with others. Do they feel more protected against a peripheral wall or do they wanna be out in the middle? And, and what is their, um, what kind of light source do they want? Do they want to be sitting next to a window so they have the um, overhead light, you know, perhaps task lighting, as well as um, natural light streaming in. So there are all these choices individuals um, make on how to situate themselves and hopefully optimize what they're doing. And, and in this case, really focusing on um, that creative thinking process. And as we know, the process does loop through um, different phases. We talked a little bit about that last week. Some of that can involve, can be done individually, and sometimes you're involving others in the process. So it looks like, Jason, you have some findings. Yeah, let's see what we got here. So what do you, yeah. what do you all guys see? And I'm trying to hide my little taskbar at the bottom here. So can you Okay. So remember, just so that everyone realizes, um, on the left would be number one, and on the right, I mean, if you're looking at the means that are in the little markers, the one is on the left and five is on the right. Mm -hmm. So if you just looked at the numbers, you'd see the difference between. <laughs> so we're seeing we're seeing more gloomy versus a more exciting space, something that feels more calming versus energetic. And again, when we start moving into the curvilinear lines and a lot more, we had talked last in our last session about that choice and control. The second space definitely offers more uh, choice and ability to flex pretty easily into different into adjacent areas, whereas you have more of the carol, um, the rows of carols, which which helps, which which can be um, another uh, preference. And again, yeah. social is almost at opposite ends of the spectrum. What do you see, Jason? Yeah, one thing I'm seeing that as a designer, I start immediately, you know, start to question. I say, well. You know, again, we're a small sample size of this, of course, so not to read too much into it, but if we start to look at sort of, you know, seriousness is sort of associated with the individual and, and playfulness is sort of more associated with some more of the social, but I, but I may start to argue, what about the adaptability? Are, are libraries, or is the space as is just providing only serious space for individuals? What about playful space for individuals? What about serious space for groups? Um, what about, you know, what is that 
latitude and can we start to really increase the gamut of spatial typology? That's sort of what I start to see in some of this data. Um, same thing, you know, formal spaces for individuals probably have a need, but what about informal spaces, um, vice versa? So I, I think some of this, um, uh, you know, of course there are no people in either of these pictures. They were taken when the library was empty. So we'd probably have very, very different results. And again, what, what the space often dictates to us when it's empty and what we think it's supposed to be used for, as you guys know, it takes on a very different dynamic um, if an individual, say, were to sit in some of those open group clusters, um, a space that could potentially have energy could quickly fall flat, say, if an individual occupied one of those territories that you're seeing, um, those lounge territories in the front seat. So that's really interesting to me just to see some of that. Or do you want to summarize some of just the overall findings that came out of the study before we jump into the sort of the student projects and the interior design? Or now we saw these last week and, you know, like I mentioned, you know, when we see um, an overabundance of students using group space, we're recommending, you know, we're finding that they want tables that allow them to spread out materials. You know, there were comments about replacing damaged furniture and, you know, the whole sense of, you know, a space that feels newer or clean, you know, and taken care of, maintained, that's important. So um, offering a variety of seating and then, you know, increasing whiteboards and offering erasers, whiteboards they use in big spaces to, you know, in addition to the way that the spaces are broken up, they break them up even more for themselves using whiteboards. Um, increasing the dinner and and dinner table and bank banquet seating, allowing for individual choice and control. We you know saw that again you know in everything that we heard is that you know students have different needs at different times, and you know sometimes they're you know what we found is that sometimes they're in the space for you know seven to ten hours at one time. And so they kind of need a way to break up that space. Um, and then, you know, offering stimulating, but not overly arousing. You know, if they want arousal, they want to go to a different spot and, you know, and use that, you know, to kind of break up the time that they spend there. And then just having the natural lighting, um, the biophilic, you know, aspects, which, you know, bringing nature inside and then, you know, being able to see out across the room, I think that makes it easier for them to see where everything is. So you can go to the next slide, please. And then the general recommendations um, that the design construction and planning team brought to us is, you know, creating this sense of place. And, and Jason's gonna go through these with visuals. And so you'll see when we talk about palette of posture or biophilic connections, he's going to get into what those mean. And so, you and know, what they look like <laughs> and, and what they look like. And so, and choice and control for I and we spaces, you know, for people in libraries, for myself, at least, you know, when I think of how would I make a change here, I'm at a loss. So that's why the collaboration was of such value for us. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that great overview, Laura. Um, so just really quick, I, I just want to go through what, what do we do as interior design schools? Um, we, we tend to be a very misunderstood profession. Um, you know, we're not this, and this is sort of the stereotype mm -hmm. we're always fighting against is people think that we automatically just pick paint colors and fluff pillows, break into your home and redecorate your, your family room while you're gone. And, 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 and really a lot of that involves a flair for design, it's a focus on aesthetics, but really what differentiates us as a field, and we are a licensed field, by the way, um, is that we are experts in human-centered design. And we really start our design process not first thinking about aesthetics or look or design flair, but we are really looking at how do we optimize human performance? How do we literally change a business um, and improve a business? How do we improve a school? How can we improve learning? So we work across all sorts of different market segments from healthcare. How can the space improve healing? 
and recovery time? How can we reduce slips and falls? In retail, how do we, how do we encourage people to actually go to a brick and mortar retail store when they can buy something from Amazon online? How do we close that deal? How can space support that? Corporate offices, interior designs are the ones that design those Google offices, those really fun creative cultures. Um, and then when we get into education, which is gonna be the focus um, of this talk, you know, we're really looking at how do we maximize the human experience of learning. Um, this is the official definition from our National um, Council for Qualification. Uh, a few words I just wanna highlight is that, you know, we are a specialized branch of architecture. And a lot of people um, confuse that because what happened is the world of architecture became so complex since the industrial revolution and our space demands, and, and even if you think about what's happened with COVID, it's mounting up so much that architecture needed interior design as a second branch to really focus on the deep human needs. And so we really are focused on health, safety, and welfare, but ultimately it's about enhancing the human experience overall. Now, as part of this is we're just not artistic creators. We combine art and science very equally. In fact, our faculty tends to to ride those lines and we have some faculty that focus only on research and others that would be your more traditional, very, you know, uh, traditionally creative designer, if you will. Um, but we do employ evidence-based methodologies as well as creative design processes um, to develop these solutions. Meg, anything that, that you would add to that? Sure, just um, briefly too, um, there are, um, just under 300 accredited interior design programs in North America, and then a few um, outposts um, in, in around the world. And interestingly, um, Metropolis um, Magazine just compiled um, a, a new ranking, um, the Future 100, that looked at the rising student leaders who are positioned as change makers in the field, the top 50 um, architecture students, the top 50 interior students. This just came out um, really a few months ago. And the University of Florida had the second most interior design students on the list. And so this was the inaugural Metropolis Future 100 and they submitted portfolio applications. They had letters, there were quite a few materials and they hail from some of the best interior design and architecture schools in the US and Canada. It says from, from Harvard to the California College of the Arts and the University of Florida. So we came in second place in terms of having the most, we had five students who made uh, this list from interior design. And I think part of the reason um, why we are so strong is because we really view that evidence-based design approach is really linking um, research into the design process and use research as a springboard for innovation. Mm -hmm. and, and just to understand that process, a lot of the process that we use for human-centered design, it, it follows any standard model for creative process where you generate ideas, you test them and you implement them. But I think the one thing that distinguishes human-centered design is the amount of empathy that we put at the top of the process that we don't view ideas just coming out of the artist's mind. They need to come from the people that we are serving. Um, they don't need to come from the leadership of the organization. They need to come in combination with the leadership and the users that we're serving. So that's very important. Really quick, just to give you some insight into how we work, we do work through a studio learning model. This is actually the classroom where we designed the, 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 the projects for Marston Science Library. 50% of our work is team-based in the studio, 50% is individual. And wherever possible, we try to work with real world design problems with real world stakeholders because we really think that's an important aspect to learning. Um, so projects like these working with the libraries are very critical um, and a very valuable resource uh, to us. Uh, here you can see some students presenting work to some of those real world stakeholders um, getting feedback. Um, and again, the, one of the main reasons that we look at real world stakeholders, you know, designers, and particularly interior design, 
we solve real world issues for, for companies, businesses, hospitals. Um, and so really what's really important is that we're just not designing good spaces. We have to design spaces that, that respond to, change, to a changing world. So we're really focused on emerging trends and paradigm shifts that are happening out in the world. And we almost let those surface um, for driving our students' decision. And, and also the other reason is that design is not one size fits all. Students need to learn that all research libraries are not the same. They'll have commonalities, but there are differences. Um, and so I think that's really the value and what's been going on in the paradigm of higher education that's been affecting classrooms and also libraries is just a very rich situation to look at um, right now. Um, so after we, after we um, started working with Marston, I just wanna give you a little insight as to why it fits so much. Um, traditionally, I, I had done a junior studio focusing on learning environments and we really primarily focused on the classroom and had had very little intersection with working with libraries. And so some of this was a natural extension but I thought that by showing you an example of one classroom we renovated within our, within our program, it might give you guys a little bit of a window into the bigger picture of libraries. So I'd like to go over that now. Um, so let's go ahead as a, as a group. This is, this is what I walk my students through um, as we start to approach education environments. Um, do you guys, if you look at this picture, are, just go ahead and unmute and speak out. Are there any issues or barriers that you see in this classroom that we should maybe consider addressing. The way the seats are set up, every student in front of the student behind them blocks people's view. They can't see the instructor. Right, yep. So they did slope the floor a little bit to try to do that. So yeah, so there, you know, sight lines might be an issue here. What else do you guys notice? It looks like there's not much space between. Um, the students' chairs, they're really crammed in there. They're really cramped, right? Okay. That's also what I was going to mention, um, that they're really cramped. They don't have enough room to spread out. Like you can see a notebook piled on things, but you can't actually open the notebook right. um, or the binder. So what, what about physical? So I heard a lot of physical things. What about socially? There's no room for group work here. Exactly. If I wanted to okay. put people into groups, the room has a very stiff barrier to that. In fact, it's practically impossible. I don't want to say impossible, but definitely uncomfortable um, to work in groups, like say groups of four. Um, so what else, um, maybe even philosophically, if you start thinking about what we're seeing, is everyone kind of on the same page right now? If yeah, you look really closely, you'll see... Yeah, go ahead, Meg. And we have um, some insight um, from Donnell in the in the chat. There's not a lot of opportunity to flow from one area of this um, this auditorium to another. Yeah, movement is definitely facilitated. How how about who has the information in the room? The information is up front, isn't it? Eyes up fr front, right? Isn't the teacher? the one that's expected to have all the information, but look at all the information resources students have at their fingertips. Um, do they have a voice in the classroom? Socially, do they feel comfortable speaking in a giant auditorium like this? Um, is there a hierarchy between the teacher and the student? I think you get the idea we can keep going deeper into this, um, but these are the issues we start questioning as design. We, we not are just looking at physical things, but social things, interaction, individual productivity. Uh, we're looking at well-being, health in the environment. Um, so, you know, the question is, have our classrooms really changed over, over time? And I think you might agree this sort of looks like sort of a traditional lecture hall that you see quite, quite commonly around. Um, I'll offer this up as comparison. This is a 14th century illuminated manuscript showing Henry of Germany. Um, and in the Western tradition of education, I would argue that not much has changed. We're still viewing the person at the front of the classroom as the gatekeeper of knowledge in the room. And we're sort of perpetuating this older system of learning, which up until recently had worked very well for us. 
but but now with the way we access information it's so different and and i also want to point out some of the commonalities <laughs> apparently they they realized sometimes it could get boring just as much <laughs> and, um so again just just a little humor for your day but you know we talk about the future education but we extend the same model to many online courses and it's not to say it's wrong but there are other ways of learning that we can perpetuate. Um, I see a lot of similarity between these three, and that is that we are really facilitating this one-way approach or a content-based approach to learning where transmission flows from the person who knows the, co the content to that who is receiving it. And it does sort of create a, a hierarchy. We've all heard the term sage on the stage. Um, not all teachers are that way, but um, but sometimes this can lead to passive engagement from students that that engagement can sometimes suffer in these environments. So when we start looking at sort of modern approaches and even what we're calling, they call them 21st century learning skills, but I'd like to point out we're getting pretty far into 21st century now, but a lot of companies are a lot of companies are looking for not what students know specifically, but how they think and operate, perhaps when they don't know everything. Um, so if we really start to look at what shifted, I think there's a lot of similarities between what libraries are dealing with versus what we as educators are dealing with. Um, and, and it really just describes why learning spaces must be different today. I think the first is the shifts in who has the keys, right? Um, libraries used to be the resource, faculty used to be the keys of knowledge, but that's, that's evolved, that's changed. Our role has definitely changed. Shifts in how students access and process information. Photos like this send willies up my spine. Um, this is how students will sometimes take notes in these classrooms. These are all cues that something's broken, that something's wrong. Um, and also the world is changing so fast that rather than teaching content only that we also need to teach for agility, adaptability, and resilience. And that really means learning from failures, developing a growth mindset versus a fixed content-based um, mindset. So just kind of in summary, when we look at this from an educational perspective, you know, education has historically taught us about the world outside ourselves with a very objective fact-based pedagogy. Um, it also trends into the developmental side. What can I learn about myself and my own inner world? But really where we're, where we're needing to go with learning spaces is to develop learning about myself in the world. What's a holistic pedagogy? How do I position myself in there? And the one area we're looking at that is active learning environments. Um, how do we really bring that holistic approach um, to bear? Meg, is there anything else to you no, want I, to add I, to that? I love the way you um, presented this. And, and we also have to talk about which, which we um, is the elephant in the room of this pandemic that is continuing on. And how do um, we had talked about Maslow's hierarchy uh, in our first session of there's some core um, physiological basic needs for having shelter, for example, for example, you know, having a certain air quality, you know, that's an expectation, being able um, to have functional, you know, lighting, functional restrooms, and then you continue to move up to more of a self-actualization. So I think uh, the students, having gone through this process, we gathered data throughout the process. The pandemic is not operating on on our time frame. You know, we're 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 fatigued now. We're tired of it. We're we're over it, as the students would say. But the pandemic, it's a new era. There's no returning to normal, right? And yeah. even the students and our the way we gathered data, the way the students designed the studio. All of that has changed. Right. So if we look at the role of interior design in this, I'm really quickly, I know you guys are excited to see some of the student uh, insights, but I did want to pause a minute just to talk about sort of the value of, of looking at interior design at this level. This was a classroom we uh, changed within our college uh, that we involved, uh, we were involved with Steelcase interior design department, but this was our classroom before, not so different. 
uh, technologies at the front of the room. You're, you know, there's at least flexibility in the seating, uh, but it was still sort of an eyes forward content based room. This is what we changed it into um, back in 2011. Um, and I just want to talk really quickly. So the difference between this and what those content based classrooms were looking like. First, there is no front to this classroom. We've sort of removed that teaching stage. The teacher can actually start class sitting next to students if they want. They can stand in the middle, but there is this automatic reduction of hierarchy. Um, students sit face to face in teams, so I can immediately address the whole classroom or I can address the team level without any, without any change. Sight lines are consistent around the room. Everybody can see everyone else's work. Personal devices can be shared at either a team or a classroom level. And then there's also equal ownership of all the classroom resources, right? Everyone gets a marker board, everyone gets a screen, chairs can be on wheels and move around. And so it really starts to create a very different dynamic. Um, I won't go into all of these, but just, I think you can see it, but I think this slide sort of says it all. You can actually see the difference in dynamic just in the way class is running. Students are actually up on the marker boards before class starts writing out information. Um, but what I want you to see is, is that really our role of interior designers and why we did this research project was to really what barriers are we creating with our infrastructure decisions? And I think, you know, Laura mentioned one that really came out in the research, which was, you know, the need to address the individual so that we can make sure collaboration can still happen properly. Um, but also other issues of student well-being. Um, what is the experience of the library that, that we want to enhance? Um, and then also, what is the culture? Because I think um, while you don't control culture, the spaces we make shape who we are as people and, and embody those values. And so really thinking not only about the mechanics of the space, but what is it culturally that you're wanting to achieve? So looking at the Marston Science Library project, as, as Meg mentioned, we had five floors in the building. Um, we decided to focus um, on two floors in this building. And these were the two floors that you assessed which was the fifth floor and the entry level. Um, the reason we did that was for students to have the sort of deal with the, the way the building stacks socially, um, but they could also question it. But we did want to see like, okay, you, we know that the research findings were saying that there are these individual issues. How do we solve for the individual? Um, and then also some other things that were expressed by the library staff was, how do we do special events? Like how do we manage events like hackathons and other things that really put extra demands on space and sort of shift people out? Um, so the interior design students were asked to work in teams, um, teams of four. So we ended up with five teams of four and they were asked to redesign these two levels of the, the floor. Um, do you guys wanna talk about the kickoff, Laura, um, since you were a part of that? Sure. So um, we brought the students into Marston um, to room 136, which is a large space in the basement. Um, and it's a collaborative room. It's got presentation space. Um, and so we just basically took them through all of the findings, um, in, including, you know, the spatial analysis, what Adrian had done with the spatial analysis and um, and then talking about the survey and what we felt we had gotten from the survey. One thing that the survey did provide is we had a lot of open text questions. And so the survey actually kind of started the process of, you know, gathering qualitative data that filled in some of these, you know, what they want and how they want to see it. Um, you know, with actually them articulating things about the space and you would get you know, very divergent views of, you know, I want something that looks like Harry Potter to something that, <laughs> you know, I want whiteboards and comfy chairs and bean bags and more technology. So it was, it really ranged quite a bit. And then we, we brought um, forward the focus group results, which included a focus group with our uh, library workers, because 
they are in the space all the time and seeing how different people use this space, moving furniture and asking for different services or resources. And so it was one more um, area of feedback that we thought was important to collect. And so we shared that with the students and then they, they took that and they ran with it. Right, and one thing we did do was summarize sort of the research findings into design drivers. We just didn't throw all the data and said, here, go, go design. Um, it, it, there was a matter of sort of synthesizing that um, for them. And I think Jason too, it's important um, to note, you had two graduate students that helped also facilitate studio and kept uh, the information flowing and they were- Absolutely. They yeah, played no, a critical we, role as well. No, they definitely did. Yeah. Um, and so students were given the work you're gonna see they created in these teams in four weeks. Uh, they got daily in-class feedback from instructors, grad students as well. And then at the end, they presented back to the stakeholder group. So. Um, I wish I could show you all of them, but we'll, we're gonna focus just on, on two main ones and then you'll see little snapshots of other ones. So we're looking at the one team that they, they saw for both floors, but I wanted to highlight this team's first floor. Um, this was part of their presentation, but this is the overall floor plan that this team um, developed. And just to sort of give you an idea, the, the upper corner, I don't know if you can see my, my arrow, let me. Yes. Yeah, can okay. you guys see my arrow? Yep. Okay, so if you look up here, this is sort of the main entry. We go into the elevators here. So the first zone we're gonna look at is gonna be sort of this front zone. And there was a little outdoor area that some students took advantage um, of in their design. Um, so one thing that was in this building prior is students noticed that um, this main entrance, which you see on the left in this bank of window walls, this bank of window walls was all private offices. And one thing the students really identified early on was, wow, these private offices are just really blocking the visual access to what's going on inside the library. And so they really started to conceptualize, can the library just not be a place to go study, but a place to meet? Hey, let's go meet at the library. Um, and so that was some of the thoughts that were brought into these earlier spaces. So you'll notice they're a little more social, they're a little bit more conversational, a little bit more loud, but by removing those offices and putting in this, this window wall, they were really able to open up that intersection, but not only that, but create an outdoor space that, that stretches out to invite participation, to make Marston a location to be at and, and to be welcoming um, at a certain level. Um, also in that adjacent area, they really wanted to make sure special events and information sharing cross pollinization would, would be done. And so they envisioned having uh, either video walls or screens in these areas to really highlight upcoming events and, and let that be visible from even outside as, as students walked by. You'll see in the background a little bit of special collections trying to let those special collections have a little bit more of a, of a presence in that, in that entry sequence. And let me, can you go back to the yes. Jason? Yes, yes. So the other thing about um, taking a, a biophilic approach to this is lighting is incredibly important um, to students and being able to maintain it. So putting um, that fenestration and pulling the natural light in did you note um, on, on the back wall, you also have included the opportunity for the light to penetrate even further into the interior and you have, um, you have ambient lighting, you have task lighting. Notice how that plays throughout this space and students are, are really cognizant that uh, the library is, 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 is open. Um, Many, many hours from early, I don't know, Laura, you can tell us and the hours have changed a bit with the pandemic, but you know, we, even in Florida, it's not sunny here every day. And so right. getting that feeling of, of the natural lighting and, and how that makes people feel was, was something that was really considered and celebrated by the student yeah. designers. And architectural lighting, artificial lighting also has the ability to be properly applied to support that further. Um, you can create spaces with lighting that have a feeling of being outside without necessarily having a view too. So there are ways 
that you can highlight things, particularly perimeter lighting. If you look at the back wall with the special collections, there's been perimeter lighting put back there, sort of makes right. the wall visually start to evaporate while highlighting that space. Um, lighting's very critical. And even nowadays, we're looking at well being standards and buildings. We're starting to tune light to circadian rhythms so that the light starts off warm in the morning, turns blue in the afternoon to actually stimulate your body and then back to warm in the, in the evenings. Um, so again, as we then walk from there, we're gonna then move into this more central area where this, this student group put the circulation desk and some other seating types. Um, one thing they were really um, wanting to do with the circulation desk is make it feel very accessible, push it out into the space, really just not make it something you had to find. Um, lower surfaces just for um, you know, ADA accessibility. You'll also notice in this area, we have circulation materials sort of tucked in the middle with two private offices tucked behind there that can, that can also serve um, the circulation desk. Uh, we also thought this office might be good for say a research librarian. Uh, this table with the screen out here, they actually thought of making the research librarian a lot more visible and accessible and giving them a space to work side by side with students um, sort of through research uh, consultations. Just a variety of seating in here. Um, I think the students could have densified this a little more personally. Um, one thing to note, these are junior students, right? So they're doing some great ideas, but you do have to you know, filter these through, I think, seasoned designers. So, so again, keeping these in mind that, that these are um, developing students, but they're really top-notch uh, students. Um, what you can see here was a little bit of an attempt to deal with a higher raised ceiling space in the atrium and try to do a little bit of a custom light fixture that starts to nod towards the sense of place that this is a science library. Um, 3D printing, their library has a makery space on this floor. Currently it's sort of behind glass and it sort of sends a vibe that maybe it could be more accessible. So stu students really thought about having sight lines of this area to, to the circulation desk. Um, and then also having this area staffed and letting 3D printing start to be a little bit more of a walk by and maybe be encouraged to join um, or ask questions sort of an experience. So again, removing barriers to access um, is important. Uh, we're then gonna move back into um, some of the active learning spaces um, that you see here. And again, this was just part of the program. We wanted to include um, uh, an active learning environment uh, within this. Now the students were also strategic to make one wall articulate out of the way. So this, this could join the bigger space to be part of hackathons or other special events, again, looking at flexibility. You can see a little bit of the branding towards this being a science library. They're playing with zeros and ones because um, we do have computer science as part of the palette of sciences. Uh, we Jason, also have Jason, one quick thing if we go back. Yeah. Um, just as an example, with um, the node chair, if you look, um, that chair is not just on casters, but it actually has a storage space that you could put a backpack or if you add a satchel, you put that and, and then if you're going to reconfigure and you have a group of eight or a group of three, um, you don't have to worry about, you know, um, trying to, you know, jump up and, and uh, uh, worry about where where that backpack is going to go, and so the node chairs. I think was a collaboration between Steelcase and IDEO, and and really came up with a nice solution here. Right. Um, so even further looking, at, I, I I sort of like the sophistication of this um, sense of place that they've done. They've sort of abstracted the biological world in trees. Um, bringing sort of a nice sense of calm and, and definition here, but then also, again, bringing in some of those uh, computer science uh, motifs was pretty interesting. Just a few other views. This team also de designed the fifth floor, which you see here, but I thought I would take you into a, another team solution on the fifth floor. Um, so the fifth floor is a smaller footprint in this building. The building tapers a little bit as it, as it goes up. 
And on this floor, this was really about solving for the individual. Um, uh, and so in, in this floor, uh, this, this particular student group really wanted to give it a more of an informal sort of quality that people could sort of feel like it is a home away from home it, to a certain extent. So you'll see um, some different treatments of furniture, um, also spatial dividers within here. So I'll try to highlight some of the more interesting ones. One thing to note is just the different types of postures they're trying to do, rocking chairs, more lounge-based furniture. You'll also see some desks, some stool height furniture. Um, and I think this was a really good solution of, of how we can start addressing the individual. If you look at this window wall, rather than creating a booth for multiple people, you can create a booth for one and really start to look at the density. You could, because people do like to spread out. So, so if we make the booth as wide as they need, but not as deep as a two person booth, then we start to split some of that difference um, to increase density. Uh, within the space. Um, there's even seating you can start to do to be on the floor. Um, and I think one thing this student group did, they even started thinking about how we could even start to take that density to some pretty fun levels. Um, looking at study lofts, almost like a loft bed uh, mirror, but in the library space where underneath those loft beds, they have uh, some desk seating, but in other cases, they have some floor-based lounge seating. Um, if a student wants to recline back a little bit more, um, you know, they might be able to do that as well. One thing to, that I'd like to add is generally these spaces um, tend to be more populated by the graduate students. And what we know about the graduate students that use the Marsden lab, Library is uh, many of them are um, getting PhDs in the natural sciences. They're working in labs and there are constraints on that lab space. And so wanting one of the um, kind of the assumptions that, that, that some of us on the design side and, and maybe even on the library side had was that the students <coughs> wanted to maintain, you know, the, the carols, that, that sacred quiet space. And, but yet there was a bit more of a social community um, in an ideal space for these graduate students. We heard a penchant for, we want to have a, a, a little bit more of a, a fun space. We want it still to be quiet. We want you know, the individual study areas, but we are doing group work um, as well. And so I, I think that we were really delighted by seeing how the design students really ran with um, this information. Mm -hmm. This is a view from one of the loft beds, just you know, I thought it was an interesting, playful concept. Um, I think one thing that's very important when thinking about library space, and I think this view kind of summarizes it, um, when you start removing stacks from the footprint of the library, you end up with big seas of space. And I think one thing that's very important to think about is how do you put masses back out on the floor plate that subdivide the floor plate into neighborhoods? You're just not designing in a big C like a cafeteria full of furniture, but how do you really start to craft different zones? And so I think you can see that in the sense of these panel wall systems start to do that, but you can also do it with, with boxes of rooms on the floor plate it can be really important. So that was just sort of two run-throughs of a complete group project. I just want to, we want to give you a little bit more of a snapshot, just sort of from across all the projects, just into these individual individual areas. And then we want to make sure we have about a half hour left. So we want to make sure we give you plenty of time for discussing and questions. So I'll um, see. But again, talking about sense of place. Um, when you think about sense of place, I think the most important thing would be that it's really your chance to make the culture that you wanna perpetuate or the culture you already have tangible. Um, and it is sort of a subtle branding. Um, it's not so different than what Apple does with all its products and, and spaces. So, so really thinking about um, particularly your particular university and, and the values that are operating there, how do you, 
start to bring those forward in a in a in a certain way. Um, you can also set social expectations. I think one thing about this area, this area starts to be a little bit more playful, um, but yet it doesn't do it in a mocking way. It, it sort of becomes fun through the use of color, through the use of things, but it, it does start to um, still promote an aura of professionalism um, as well. And this one, this has a much more informal side up here. So again, thinking of those sliders between formal and informal space, again, what we see in as trends right now are to start breaking down spaces as third place spaces that become more informal and home-like. We see that in the workplace as well as in education um, in between spaces. And it can be as subtle as just little subtle touches that let you know you're in a science library. Um, the student's use of science as art, I think was a really interesting notion. And again, I think um, when you go to that abstract level, it's so much better than, you know, in that, that last slide where it's, it's, it's creating more of a word cloud. Yeah. I think that, yeah, I, I think that doesn't word have cloud same, was not appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't have the same energy. And so you can, you can see, and, and again, the process is the student can show this this week and then get critique and then have right. um, several other alternatives sort of, you know, right moving moving forward um keeping what really works well in this uh space as well this was a neat uh, idea the students had in terms of massing back on that floor plate to divide up the space the circular mass really kind of draws you and encourages movement throughout the space it also subdivides it into different neighborhoods and on the inside of that is a is a round room of resources and printers and things of that nature so it kind of becomes a resource hub um, so this is that the big one we talked about, which was really how do we how do we encourage collaboration by addressing this overwhelming need of the individual. Um, I think you guys already intuitively know that I saw a lot of head shaking, but uh, here's a just a picture of another library um, where you can sort of see three territories of clusters of four people that are intended to be groups. And in the first one, we see a group using it. But if you look in the last two, you see individuals occupying it. So if you really look at analyzing this cluster, uh, we have three territories. So if we max out the potential by groups, you could have three groups of four and this space could serve 12 people. But if you then start maxing this out by individuals, well, the minute one person sits in any of those zones, it sort of becomes their defensible space or their territory. And so I know a lot of times when we start looking at budgets, right, we say, oh, well, we don't have enough money to, to deal with the individuals in the way we need. Well, the thing is, is from a cost standpoint, you know, if individuals are, end up using these spaces and it does take it away from a group, you know, you're not maximizing your space. You're spending about three times much more for the three chairs that aren't being utilized. So it's, it is something that, that can be quite an ordeal. Um, again, going back to this one where you can sort of see a different density here. In fact, side by side, these are about equivalent in square footage um, in terms of how you can start to address it. And again, I think it's still providing, well, why does somebody wanna sit at these group spaces? Because they can spread out. So if you do create an individual area, give them the width, the width they need, but maybe not perhaps the depth that you would take to do this for, for a group as well. Um, and also providing variety in seating. Um, here's another example where a student sort of did the one booth Kind of, kind of seating. It's maybe not as wide as it needs to be, but even looking at different levels of privacy by bringing that panel on up, they started to make these a little bit more secluded than the ones you see here with the with the lower panels by the window. Um, and again, I think we've already walked through that one. Um, the other thing is looking at pallet of posture because sometimes we might think of using lounge seating only for collaborative conversation zones or conversation groupings. Um, and so it might be important thinking about the individual that you provide an individual with a lounge chair option, that you provide an individual with a stool, you provide an individual with a booth. So just making sure there's sort of parity between those, but just looking at all the different ways we can interact. Um, and this is a prime example. These students ended up showing this, probably how it would start to lay out 
with individuals occupying a space. So this, this image isn't showing a good utilization of, of space, but just look at all the differences that we can sit. We can sit at table height, we can sit on lounge, we can sit on stool. Um, again, three different posture options here from sitting on the floor to reclining back um, in, a, in a more tablet recliner mode um, to, to again, sitting in a booth. Um, even just little spaces that you can find and carve out. I think some of these shapes are not really conducive to leaning. I think the one on the right needs to be refined a little bit, but I think the, the red shape starts giving me some thoughts about just little places people can find and cubby up in. We saw a lot of students putting furniture down low um, stretching out on the floor or, or stretching out in, in some lounging positions. So, so again, sort of analyzing that everything's not just a table, that there may be a variety. And palette of posture really does go to well-being. Um, it allows you to move throughout the day. So even there are desks with walking treadmills that, that can be utilized to support well-being and movement during work. Um, and I thought this was an interesting thought towards well-being. We had some students actually starting to think about lights that change color. And we start thinking about uh, people that are on the spectrum is a growing population. Rooms like this could potentially start to provide um, some support for them. Uh, this biophilic connection to nature came up in the data. And one thing to realize is it's great to have views to the outside and natural light, but a lot of times we don't always have it. But when you start thinking about lighting and texture and pattern and materiality, there's a lot you can do to be very suggestive of it. So here's an example where the, the main window wall is, is quite far away in the distance. It's a nighttime view, so it's kind of hard to see. But, but this group really tried to foster a connection to letting that light come in deep. They're playing with sort of organic forms and even brought in a living wall around, around a help desk area. Um, and so just the use of natural woods and things can start to create these. This is a floor plan just to show you how they conceived of this sort of central penetrating zone connecting to the outdoor space and just sort of creating sort of the seamless bridge inside outside. I thought they could have pushed it further in all honesty, but the, but the general idea is quite sound. Um, and then just even looking here, um, here we have the great views on this, this floor, but even going further into the introduction of plants and just the softness um, and some of the more natural movements do create sort of a, a more peaceful, calming, uh, natural quality to it. And I think um, therein too, you have lighting and materiality and texture. And we live in North Central Florida, almost as far away as you can get from a beach and be in Florida, <laughs> um, but in Gainesville, our claim to fame is, if you have been here, is being under a live oak canopy with Spanish moss. And mm -hmm. that permeates the campus. There's just lush and gorgeous and um, um, really kind of exciting landscape and bringing that in. And the designers are working with color, but it's within a limited palette, seeing what the full <laughs> spectrum of, of greens are and really working with and playing with that um, interesting and subtle and sophisticated um, applications of, of tone and texture and light. And the last area we're going to look at is probably one of the most critical. I, I, I hope to drive home for you guys, um, or that we hope to drive home for you guys. Um, and that is really thinking of space as an ecosystem across a few different dimensions. And it's ultimately, when we talk about supporting creativity at both team and, and individual levels, it's about maximizing choice and control. Keeping in mind that choice and control will be eroded by overcrowding, right? Because when we get too many bodies in the room, that choice and control diminishes. And so I think the first thing is knowing where are you standing on your numbers of people and utilization in the building, but then how do we balance it out? Um, this is a model proposed by a steel case uh, but it's, it's in the environment and behavior literature that really puts space on four different dimensions. We have the I spaces, that's when I'm alone. We have the we spaces, that's when I'm together. And across those two dimensions, we either have areas that we're publicly or, or sharing with other people at that moment, or we're, we're either owning this, a private space or we're just needing more privacy. So privacy is running the vertical dimension and then 
group are alone as the horizontal. And this is just a quick image that, that they generate showing that, that your best solutions always create an ecosystem of these choices on any given floor plate or zone within a building or an office. And that allows you to kind of easily flex and naturally flow from one to the other. And if you think about it from a work day, you might work behind your desk, but then you have a meeting you run to, or then you have to brainstorm with somebody, or you have to go um, do some kind of interaction, social interaction. So these things play out in the library. So just jumping back to some of these slides, so you can see the connection, um, a space for an individual can be a little bit more shared and a little bit more publicly present um, as part of, it's an I in a community. That's sort of like going to the coffee shop versus you can start to do some shielding that gives you more privacy, or you can even enclose somebody in a room. Uh, all sorts of phone booth uh, designs nowadays that allow for individuals to work alone. Um, looking at how screens can start to create sense of privacy in open areas. Um, uh, and, and again, being intentional about it, I think uh, I've seen one design on another building on campus, it wasn't a library, but where mobile marker boards got taken over by students not to actually write on, but to sequester themselves and claim their own territoriality sort of selfishly. So, so again, these things, are, they, are, they are complex. I think this one's interesting because we see some iPublic seating in terms of one-sided tables. Um, where students can sit, but then also that back wall for that classroom is a we private space, but that wall can articulate back out of the way and then it can join for a larger um, sort of hackathon or other type of larger library event. Um, in fact, I think the students even designed those, those lower table areas and higher areas to allow for workstations for, um, for special events or display tables. If we start looking at the student examples, as we start analyzing space based on choice and control, this is what that looked like on that one first level floor plate. And so you see, we have all those four pallets of dimension and, and this serves several functions. Um, you'll notice here that more of the we shared spaces um, are, are evident out here. And that's because this is naturally a louder floor. It, 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 it's a floor to be seen and, and, and to be heard and, and to gather large groups together. So it makes sense. But at the same time, you still need to provide, you can see the light blue areas that there is still seating that allows for individuals to still filter in there. And if you can make them as comfortable or even more comfortable than those collaborative ones, you're probably gonna be optimizing your real estate a little bit better. Um, when we shift this on up to the upper floor for this particular group, um, you can see we still provide the ecosystem, but you wanna think of ecosystem as there's a macro feeling of the floor. And so for this floor, since it's mostly I shared spaces and I own spaces, we're still trying to keep this floor quiet. You'll notice this group did put a, uh, a acoustically isolated uh, area for, for weird, we shared activities up there. Um, and a lot of these were in more enclosed spaces to start to create some of that uh, variability. Um, so just keeping in mind that even if a floor has an overall vibe, you can still provide that flex um, you know, within it. And that brings us to the end of our presentation where we, we thought we would sort of, um, in the last, uh, we've got about 15, 20 minutes here. Um, thought we wanted to make sure we opened it up to questions for the three of us, but we also um, thought we would sort of round table, okay, what is the benefit of, of doing these collaborations? Um, do you guys have any questions for us as a team in terms of the benefits we saw, um, the outcomes? Uh, because I think we, we, we saw a lot of benefits. And then also, if you guys have any questions for your own spaces that you're wrestling with, I mean, we have designers in the room. So um, I think we'll just round table it. Meg, do you wanna, you wanna lead this part here? Um, well, you know, quickly, we, um, we met frequently. Um, in spite of, of not being able to um, have those face-to-face -face meetings that, that kicked off and defined the original collaboration. 
and uh, Val, I'd see these 8 a.m. you know invites for our you know ARL meetings, and I think that what was so exciting was was actually the the thing is, and and Laura can give you the rest of the story is we have funding to make some of these ideas a reality, and that was an unexpected. Um, byproduct of, of this, which was really exciting. So again, from the design side, the University of Florida is, is, is a large um, you know, land grant flagship campus in the state of Florida. And uh, we operate on a very tight infrastructure, oftentimes have a pretty tight budget, but when when design can get involved and we can really shape these students that help optimize the student experience help create community when students are feeling isolated with the biophilia helping um really in the case with student even mental health issues and that feeling that that so many of us also have of lack of connection lack of meaning it's very exciting for us to do this and i think this library project in collaboration has been one of the most rewarding. We have worked with the law school, with mathematics, with physics, with biology, with psychology, with um, the Jewish, Jewish Studies um, Center, as well as the Center for African American Studies. All of these are exciting, engaging. It's exactly what we want to do with our upper division students and working with the team as, you know, engaging as, um, Laura and Val and you know Sarah and Sheila. It was just great and Adrian. But um, Laura, what do you what do you think in terms of benefits for? for and I also parties? see a question from Ava as well. So yeah, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Ava, and then I'll come back around. Not so much a, a question as a comment. What what um what I think is another really um, interesting benefit is I think so. I'm I'm a librarian. I, I I work at a service point in a in a crowded area. I know a little how the users interact with the space. So it was so gratifying to hear from an interior design expert say if you have that if you don't. Um, address that individual need, then those group mm -hmm. tables are taken up by one person. Mm -hmm. I have said this all the time. I think other librarians know that, but mm -hmm. collaborating with other experts who, who then also have data, I think that helps us communicate upwards uh, to advocate for um, uh, changes to our spaces that make sense and then uh, um, will also be used in the way that that we envision it and meeting those those needs. So that was a, a, a benefit, I think, uh, that was very unique to this uh, to this collaboration. So I, I just wanted to highlight that that really gives us a lot of ammo to to communicate upward to our admin to that kind of decision making level uh, uh, in a way that makes sense. And then we're, we're also using our, our professional resources as well as our kind of lived experiences as you know, librarians that's, that's too. That's a really great point is when it's evidence-based, um, it, it really, you can make a very compelling case. And the other piece, um, just briefly, is I know um, if you get involved in advancement or fundraising, when you have spaces designed by students for students and we can visualize this, you can really get potential donors excited. And we have seen that happen again and again and again. So while we do have you know, some state support to make, to really realize the ideal spaces, you do often need private fundraising and having again, spaces that are designed for students, by students, guided by licensed architects and designers is just a win-win. And, and getting images from a, it, from this process could potentially be what's needed to get a donor, you know, to get excited about something. But Ava, I think one thing I would build on with that is there's other precedent, right? Um, education tends to follow the history of the business world, right? And if we look at what's happened with offices, we started off in a world of private offices. And then in the 60s and 70s, we opened it up with cubicles and da 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 da. And then in the name of collaboration, we, we almost erased privacy from the expertise and experience in that corporate office. And so now we've reached this privacy crisis 
in the corporate world that now we're realizing, no, it's, it's about this ecosystem. It's not, it's not this trend. It's not just because libraries are now forced with this need for creativity. It doesn't mean I, the, the utilization is still more towards the lone student with their heads down, getting some work done. I mean, there's there, but that said, it's, it's in a different way. So even thinking about how do you take students, how do we optimize every lever to where it's on a continuum? And that is formality, informality, alone together, playful seriousness, like every single thing, if you provide choice and control, and then do your best looking at densification. I think that's the, the main challenge is what I see right now in a lot of libraries across the country. And, and even a few of the other ones on our campus is the stacks are gone, they clear it out. And then it's this giant sea of, 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 of sameness that, that just the, it, it doesn't allow for what needs to happen. And so by looking at this ecosystem, it really, it really not only answers what you need right now, but if you think about, if you think about not thinking of space prescriptively, instead of saying, oh, we need a conference room, don't say conference room. You need a, a, a we private space. And, and when yeah. you start looking at things from this four point framework, because a we private space can be turned into an I private space temporarily if somebody uses it, right? Um, any of these things can shift and adapt. And so by not being proprietary about space, this is also tied to resiliency because as COVID hits, by not saying this is the conference room, this is that, this is that. And you can even look at con a conference room could be turned into uh, workstations just by how the furniture is, is configured within the space. So I think the more you can think about how do you maximize well, first you have to know what your need is, how many individuals versus, versus group. And then you have to do everything to make the individual stuff sexier to the, to the students to go, to go sit there so they aren't you know, messing up your, your densification. You, know, you can't control people's behaviors, you can only suggest it. So it's not to say it's a cure-all, but, but if it's done right and thoughtfully, um, and it usually comes down to that furniture budget. So what I would say is the more you're just not ordering your own furniture, but working with either, you know, vendors have on staff and tier, you know, larger vendors like Steelcase or Herman Miller, they have on staff um, uh, interior designers that would have that expertise to really make sure you're getting the most bang for your buck. They'll help you to, to also save money and still get a solution that works. Um, you know, if, if that's necessary. Um, but I also think looking very closely at adjacency and territoriality is really where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck because then, then space really starts to work in, in all dimensions for you. Any other questions in the group? Laura, what would you say then was the biggest benefit from your guys' perspective, kind of going back to, um, you know, since you're in this library group here, you know, that maybe you could speak to how they might consider reaching out to some programs on their campus. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we were lucky to have, you know, um, design construction and planning, you know, as an entity on campus and doing the kind of work that they do. We'd had a study previously um, conducted by Sheila Bosch, who was on our research team and, and she did an unobtrusive observation of, of student use of library spaces in Marston um, a couple of years ago. And that's kind of where, you know, I first saw together alone, well, I mean, I've read Bowling Alone, but this is, you know, definitely um, related to this study and, you know, and kind of witnessing how people, you know, really it's actually what it brought to us is the way to articulate what we already were seeing. You know, we were, you know, when I coach librarians on assessment, I tell them, you know, 
don't discount your anecdotal <laughs> observations. That's where you start. And then you, but you marry that with data and other ways of looking at what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And so having this group with us, we really, you know, were able to draw on expertise, gain new language to use to talk about, you know, biophilia. You know, I'd never used that word before, but it made all kinds of sense in this, you know, and especially seeing these things in the data. So that was really, really helpful. And it kind of gave us a way to direct the project, which we didn't really know how we were going to do that. And so it gave us a lot of good um, tools to use to, you know, to talk about it, to collect the data, and then, you know, to bring some analysis and, you know, having other academic faculty be a part of it, I was able to <laughs> indulge um, myself in, you know, a little bit more analysis and really kind of connecting and really to achieve what is one of the goals of the research library impact framework, which is to produce something that's scalable. And, you know, we haven't had a really good chance to test that. Um, Stephanie's team at Syracuse, you know, deployed the survey, but they were constrained by COVID as well. And so participation rates, you know, were a struggle for them, but, um, you know, and we had similar things. Um, so we still really look forward to an opportunity, at least I do, of, you know, working this out with another location and seeing, you know, post COVID and in a different environment, how does this translate? And have we really produced something that meets, you know, one of the purposes of this project. So it, from that perspective, it really gave us an opportunity, you know, to go for all of those um, objectives. So questions, um, I, I shared this survey last week um, and we're gonna share out all our slides at the end of the three workshops. But um, certainly we're happy to share anything that we've you know, shown. So feel free to get in touch with us. Um, we don't have our slides up anymore, but I'm putting in the chat. It's okay. okay. I put it in the chat. You know, I just want to make a plug for workshop three, and that's going to be I've got really it. a deeper dive into the analysis of the data and you know, kind of connecting everything together. Um, with the way that we approach this. So thanks, Jason. And yep. other questions or comments? So I just wanna thank um, Meg and Adrian and Jason, because this was just such a great opportunity to work with some incredibly creative people who, you know, looked past book stacks and saw other potential for our spaces. So it was really, really a joy to do this project. And I think, didn't you feel, Laura and, um, you know, Jason and Adrian, I mean, just hearing the voices of the students, I mean, these libraries, they don't want them to become, you know, commons. They don't want them to become student unions. They really, um, the students were pretty passionate about the role of the library and how important that was. And, um, you know, again, at all levels from first year students through masters and graduate students, um, it was interesting hearing from the international students and, and the library is, is, is really, um, I view it as a, you know, as a sacred space on campus and really hearing how strongly they feel about this space. And there was a lot of palpable excitement. Um, we didn't have people drifting off from the focus groups. I mean, they were really engaged and they could have, I think, continued the conversation for, you know, even, even, you know, much longer too. So, so that was interesting to me and I, and it was heartening. <laughs> There's a it looks question. like you may have one more question before we before we close and and thank everyone was in the chat about so, specific dis, um, 
different spaces, spaces in the room. Yeah, so the, the, the question is, were there any discussions about specific space rooms? So yoga, wellness, lactation, et cetera, meditation. You know, I think that's a very important mm -hmm. point. I know nowadays, um, these are almost required in the corporate world. And again, we're always catching up in, in education for, I think, providing these things. And I think um, wellness, you know, a, a specific wellness room. So if somebody isn't, uh, you know, feeling well, they can go to. But I also think making sure in this context, I would make sure it's probably adjacent to some connection to further wellness resources. But I, I like the idea of well-being to be employed as a broad brush, brush across but then thinking, are there spaces students could safely go into, um, you know, mm -hmm. you, you would want to locate those types of things where there is some observation, I think, from library staff, if you're going to have specific wellness rooms um, from a security standpoint. But I think um, providing those would be very important. I think also if you saw the slide about uh, one, one group had an idea of having a room where you could change color LEDs, shift the lighting to what you really wanted. Again, the more you can give people control, the more you do contribute to their ability to, to garner wellness too. So I think that that's a very important um, aspect and also provide enough facilities that, that we are keeping crowding in check because again, crowding also um, does, you know, can cause issues, so. Um, I think thinking about special populations, you, you know, you might also think about, you know, we're talking about a broad, you know, general group of users, but we do have special populations from, uh, you know, people with different disabilities to, and different needs to, um, um, you know, all sorts of issues, so trying to, trying to make maybe dedicated specific spaces for those needs would be very important as well as just like an <clears throat> ecosystem. Well, let me thank you. Thank you, Jason, Meg, and Laura for another wonderful workshop. I've, I've, I've loved the, the images and pictures that you were sharing of, of different spaces and ideas. Um, and I think you've set up a, a great teaser for the third workshop on, on May 4th. Um, so thanks again, everyone for attending. Thanks to the UF team. Uh, for another great workshop, and we will see you all soon. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's been fun.